Hi, this is Omar Khalifa, CEO of iAccelerate, and uh, welcome to another session of iAccelerate Remote, where we talk to founders of uh, the businesses that are at iAccelerate and talk to them about their experiences, including how they're responding to the COVID crisis. So uh, with us today, we have uh, Andrew Short, one of the founders of uh, Verbotics. Sure, absolutely. Um, so like I said, my name's Andrew. Uh, about two or three years ago, together, along with two others, I co-founded Verbotics. Um, our company makes software that automatically programs the world in robots. Um, that might not sound particularly uh, novel, but uh, industrial robots are really a tool that's underutilized, particularly by Australian manufacturers. Uh, and the difficulty that people have to program welding robots is really the number one challenge holding back adoption. Um, welding robots are generally programmed in a really time consuming and expensive way. And you need highly skilled people to come in and program a robot uh, so you can use one in your factory. Um, and so I aim to change that by making software that's really easy to use. Um, and you don't need to be a robotic expert to program a robot to manufacture a part. Um, so as you can imagine, we're targeting kind of low volume, highly customized niche manufacturing industries, um, who previously robots were just too expensive, too difficult to program to even be considered. Um, but with our software, these kind of companies can start using robots more effectively. Um, so in terms of our company background, uh, we have three co-founders, myself, Nathan Larkin, and Zhengxi Pan. Uh, we all met at the University of Wollongong. Uh, at the time, both Nathan and I, well, I was a PhD student, Nathan was a research fellow, and Zhengxi was my PhD supervisor. Um, and the university has a strong background in practical industrial automation research. So really trying to bridge the gap between what happens in academia in terms of how robots are used and what happens in industry. Uh, so Nathan in particular worked on a really successful project for a defense vehicle manufacturer um, who were really struggling to program their robots and they pioneered new techniques to help program their robot more effectively. Um, a few years after that, I joined and we then further developed that work uh, and we continued to improve it. And we were trying to make the transition from a research only project to one that we really thought had legs to be applied in the industry. Um, so obviously a university is not really the, the uh, ideal place to commercialize a product. You know, the research outcomes were starting to drop off at the same time the commercialization outcomes were starting to pick up. Uh, so we thought it was a good time to make the leap uh, and start our own company uh, at Accelerate. Yeah, so you've been there how long now? So it's over a couple of years? Yeah, three years, I think. Three yeah. years, yeah. So, Andrew, um, just the stages since you've come in, what were, how did you t look at the market or what, and what, what evolved for you as to understanding where you would fit in this, uh, in, in the market? Um, I think when we started, we knew we had a really great technology product or we could make a really great technology product. We had r very little understanding of how to actually sell that to people. Um, we had no idea where we should target in our market, who we should target. Um, the way we operate is there's a lot of people who are involved in a robotics project. There's a person who needs the robot, the person who sells the robot, the person who makes the robot, the person who makes the welding equipment that attaches to the robot, the person who programs the robot. There's a whole bunch of different companies that come together to make the project a success. Um, so even which of those companies or which person within those companies we target to try and sell our product to. Um, so really, yeah, we came with the idea of what we wanted to make. Um, but we didn't have a focus on how we differentiate ourselves from existing products in the market. We didn't have a focus on who we would, who we would target, who we partner with, to try and get our product into factories. Um, so working with the program to accelerate and just, you know, talking to people who have gone through similar challenges with their own products has helped us really focus that um, and shift a little bit of our focus onto you know, areas where we're uniquely, you know, have a unique advantage. Now you've, you've had some international experience. So obviously some of the robotic companies or robot uh, making manufacturers are in other, other places in Europe, US and elsewhere. Um, how have you managed to reach out to them and how do you begin to think about yourselves as a, as a global player? Because really a lot of the market would be there. Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, Australia is a tiny manufacturing market um, compared to the globe and robots are particularly underutilized within Australia. Um, so our very first client was actually uh, in New Zealand. Um, it actually took us a little while to get our first Australian client. Um, it is a challenge as a small company. Uh, you know, we only have th three employees. Um, you know, we're limited to one time zone. And if you visit our website, we're very obviously an Australian company. Um, so we've taken a few approaches to try and I guess punch above our weight. The first one is to really reduce the barrier of entry to using our software. Uh, so typically in our field, um, companies have large sales teams. They have you know, very hands-on demonstrations. They'll get people to go and visit customer sites to try and promote their products, uh, which is obviously something that we can't do. So we've tried to really eliminate as many barriers to entry using our software as we can. 
Um, you can download a free trial from our website. All our documentation is publicly accessible. We provide examples to try and you know, walk people through um, how to use our software um, without us necessarily having to physically go and visit people. Um, so that's been one really big benefit. Um, the other one is just being really clear um, and direct and responsive in communication with clients. Um, I guess our advantage of being small companies, we can be agile, we can, you know, the people who ask us questions are getting directly through to the technical people rather than to a salesperson who may not necessarily know the kind of the detail that they're after. Um, so in some ways that's actually an advantage that some customers have expressed to us, the fact that we're a small team, but we're quick to respond um, and we can answer their questions in a, you know, a direct way um, has been a really big benefit as well, feeling internationally. And that's one of the areas that, you know, I think are underestimated, you know, because a lot of times, you know, people like yourself are, are, are in, a, in a market with big players. And so mm -hmm. to how to compensate for the fact that you're small is obviously to have that agility and that responsiveness, which I think you've really capitalized on. That's great. Um, if you could just go into, you know, thinking about what happened now with, you know, COVID hitting and how you, what that meant to your, to your, to yourselves and your business um, and what maybe uh, measures you've taken since then or what you've relied on more. Uh, trying to deal with that and, and looking out the other side of it? Um, so probably not a, a big surprise, but as a small technical company, our sales and marketing is probably a weak point for us. Um, so you know, we, we uh, decided late last year to try and focus on that in early 2020. Um, so unfortunately in March, we had a big trip to Melbourne to schedule, uh, schedule to go and visit a whole bunch of people working in our industry, um, really kind of put, our, put ourselves out there. Um, and then we booked a booth at our very first trade show, I think it's supposed to be happening about now originally. Um, so we really decided to focus in the first half of 2020 on pushing out, um, you know, not just relying on people coming in to find us, but actually pushing out, going and visiting people, having some more active marketing and sales channels. Um, and then COVID happened and that kind of put a whole big break on that whole process. Um, it, you know, it seemed like one, as a few days before we were scheduled to leave to Melbourne, we're looking at all the, these restriction measures coming in and exponential growth in COVID cases, trying to make the decision of if we want to go and risk perhaps getting stuck in Melbourne or not being able to fly back. Um, so obviously our plans had to change pretty dramatically. Um, so we've really had to pause that whole process. Um, we've you know, still obviously will focus on it again when it is possible, but um, that obviously no longer managed to happen. Um, and more generally, we rely on people to invest in robotics in their manufacturing. Um, in times like now, people are less willing or you know, they're focusing on their core business and their viability rather than trying to invest in robots uh, at the moment. So obviously, the amount of interest in, in our software and you know, small, small factories purchasing robots has dropped off pretty significantly too. So that's also been a challenge. A number of projects that we thought were very promising have been put on hold or cancelled. Um, so that's really been a bit of a challenge for our, you know, our forecast sales for the rest of the year have really declined, unfortunately. Um, the silver, I guess the silver lining of this is for the first half of this year, we've really focused on product development. So rather than us being um, busy flying around, visiting people, doing lots of sales, we've been able to focus on a lot of technical things, um, which, you know, I'm a, my background is in computer science, so I'm perfectly happy to do that um, and tell you let the sales take a back seat. That's kind of my forte. Uh, so that's been good. Um, another good thing is the government benefits, particularly the JobKeeper subsidy has been really helpful. Um, we have a casual developer who was working with us. Um, he's really fantastic. We've actually been able to slightly increase his hours uh, due to that particular benefit. So um, luckily, you know, the, our number of employees hasn't changed. We've actually been able to slightly increase the number of hours um, primarily due to that government benefits. So that's been absolutely fantastic. Um, and then even though it's been a quiet time in terms of projects, um, there's actually been a few exciting opportunities come up. We're talking you know, with other companies about partnering in various ways. Um, we're looking to get our first kind of sales partner uh, in Europe as well. So we're currently going through some negotiations for that. Uh, so just you know, opportunities that exist, we're still pursuing them as much as we can. Um, it's just that yeah, new projects are a little bit, uh, you know, the, the time frame has probably been pu pushed back six months for a number of robotics projects that we were hoping to, uh, to be part of robots might be the replacement for people who can't go to work anymore. Mm. So maybe coming out of it, people begin to realize that they might need a more balanced workforce that includes some robotics to actually help them through uh, you know, downturns like this. But the capital investment yeah. is, is, is still important and that um, may have dried up for, for some of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, we're hoping it'll kind of bounce back uh, pretty strongly. Obviously the government will be looking to drive investment, um, you know, through things like their instant asset write-offs. Um, so hoping, 
some of our potential clients will take advantage of those um, once the COVID restrictions, um, you know, fully ease. They, you know, um, and there's a lot of people talking about onshoring manufacturing to ensure we have domestic supply chains. So if that does eventuate, that could also be quite a significant opportunity for us as well. Um, Andrew, there's there are other founders out there who are you know looking at the situation and struggling with some of the issues you've struggled with and others have. Um, what's what what's where's your touchstone or what do you go back to when you know when you think things? Oh my goodness, what do I do now or what do we do now as a company? What what is it what is it that you've learned to sort of get yourself back on track again? Or um, I guess the first piece of advice is it is challenging. Um, you know when you have a you think you have a fantastic year of projects lined up and a number of promising leads and then you just watch a lot of them get put on hold um, or, you know, people withdraw investment. That's, that's, um, that's pretty challenging to deal with. Um, but I guess the main thing is if, you know, if that is a situation that you're in, you just have to adapt to deal with it. Um, you know, we weren't put in an ideal situation due to COVID and a number of projects being frozen, um, but we just have to deal with it. Um, we've had to adapt to the situation that we're given. And there are other people who are going through similar things for you within Ike's low rate as well. So just having a network that we can draw on, people we can talk to, um, alternate ideas we can explore. Um, so I guess the main thing is, yeah, you know, acknowledge the challenges, but adapt to overcome them. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, look, I really enjoyed speaking with you. We don't see you guys around. We don't, you don't see me either. We're all working from home a lot more. Um, I think that will begin to shift now, but uh, thanks for your time today. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, look forward to seeing you, uh, you, uh, you and the rest of your founders uh, one of these days soon. This is Omar Khalifa with uh, iAccelerate Remote, so we'll um, wrap it up and see you next time.